two videos in one day. I'm super excited. So I read the Bible. Well, I, I've been reading it from beginning to end for the past few years. I think since 2018. And um, I've been taking notes on things and writing things down. So a lot of the assumptions that we have, one, one big assumption is God does wonderful things. And by wonderful, we mean pleasant, kind, good, loving. Literally, wonderful means things that we wonder at. Things that are like um, beyond our comprehension. We don't understand them. That's that's literally what wonderful means. The as the language evolves, it it tends to mean positive things, rather than um, including negative things. Also, so when we say wonderful, it means um, good things. But God is wonderful in that He confounds us, and He is beyond what we understand. So I read the Bible and I try to look for things or try to take notes on things that don't make a lot of sense. And so I've grown up, as I'm sure many of you have, with this idea that wonderful is positive and pleasant and kind and good. But that's not what happens in the Bible. And so the first time I read this, I think the first time I noticed this, well, maybe it wasn't the first time, but Judges, there is a passage where God does something very peculiar if you believe that God only does positive things. And all the negative things he only does in reaction to us, like for example, uh, a judgment, like on Sodom and Gomorrah, he rained fire and brimstone and he wiped the cities out. So that is the thing that he did in reaction to um, their sin. And we don't see God as acting preemptively, meaning people, God just wiping people out because they're sinners, or God in not in reaction to any specific sin or God letting people continue in their sin and not bringing them out of it but instead pushing them forward more in their sin so that they they compound what they're doing and it becomes worse for them and eventually they're destroyed or they destroy themselves I've grown up with a sense that God doesn't do that kind of thing, in that he doesn't actively, and I, I don't even know what word to use, but he doesn't actively push us forward in our sin. Now, the Bible says he doesn't tempt us, and I've been trying to find the verse where it says he's not the author of sin, and, and, I don't, and he doesn't, God does not sin. I'm not trying to say that, but if you read the Bible, there are passages where God actively wants us to be deceived. It doesn't say he deceives us. But if you read Judges 9, I'm going to read it right now. This is a story of Abimelech, who was an evil judge. And he had a, a conflict with the town of Shechem. And they were a bunch of evil men in that town. And God wanted to judge all of them. But instead of just destroying them or sending maybe another country or tribe to destroy them, this is what he does. Um, Judges 9.23 God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt, dealt treacherously with Abimelech so that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam, this was Gideon, um, Abimelech had murdered the sons of Jeroboam. Now these were his brothers. He murdered them so that he could be king. And Shechem, like, they colluded with him. But it says here that God sent an evil spirit 
to deceive both of them, to set them against each other so that they destroyed each other. Now, there's another uh, passage in Second Chronicles where the same thing happens again. Now, see, God is not deceiving these people, but he is directly in charge of, a, of sending an evil spirit to deceive them. Now, this is how it's described in Second Chronicles. This is where God is sending a spirit to deceive Ahab, who was an evil king. He sent him into battle with Jehoshaphat, who was kingdom of, the king of Judah. He said they fight against, who was this? Ramath Gilead. This is Second Chronicles 18. And so there's all these false prophets who are telling Ahab, go fight, go fight, and God will be with you and he will uh, cause you to win. And Ahab goes, well, no, Jehoshaphat goes, is there a real prophet of God that we can inquire of? And Ahab goes, there's Micaiah, but I hate him because he always prophesies doom. So Jehoshaphat goes, okay, call Micaiah. And so Micaiah, the first thing he says was, the Lord will bless you, go into battle, blah, blah, blah. And Ahab is like, stop lying, I know you're lying. <clears throat> And so here's what Micaiah says. I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. This is Second Chronicles 18. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Micaiah goes on. Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right and on his left. The Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said, How? He said, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, You are to entice him and prevail. Also, go and do so. Verse 22, Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these your prophets, for the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. So God sends a spirit to deceive Ahab, so that he will go into battle and die. And that's exactly what happened. Ahab is killed, and that was God's judgment. So, did God lie? No. He told him exactly what he's doing. But he sent lying spirits to them to, facil to facilitate their destruction. And we see this um, in Matthew. Jesus says, I praise you, Father, because you have not revealed yourself to these um, to these people. He, okay, so Matthew 11 Jesus condemns all these cities. Matthew 11, 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles that had incurred in Tyre and Sidon, and which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So Jesus condemns them for not believing in him. And then he says, verse 25, Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. And then he goes on, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, nor, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So Jesus says, after, right after he just judges these cities and condemns them, and says you're you're doomed he says praise i praise god that this is what you have done and i don't want them to know nor does anyone know the father except the son and anyone to whom the son wills to reveal him either god or himself either way it's the same thing so we have this judgment First of all, in the, in the Old Testament, that God sends a deceiving spirits. Here, that God does not reveal himself. We have a similar um, idea in Isaiah. 
where he says, no wait, Isaiah 6, keep on speaking. Go and tell his people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of his people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, heal with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. So this is Isaiah 6, where God is saying, they're not going to understand because they have been judged. So I got into, well, I'm always getting into arguments, but I, had, I, I said the same comment to somebody on Twitter. He said, well, it hasn't, has, has not God, because this guy's Armenian, and he's like, well, if we don't believe in Calvinism, isn't that God's will, according to Calvinists? Why would God not want us to believe in Calvinism? Well, yeah, it is God's will, because you have been judged. And if he does not reveal these things to you, it's because that's the way he wants it. And it's not something he was going to kind of be sarcastic about it. And I said, it's not, it's not something to scoff at. It's, it's something to, to be really scared about. And yeah, there are a lot of examples in the Bible. So what do we do? Well, just, I don't know. <laughs> What we always do, we, we preach the gospel, we pray for God to open hearts, and He will when He wants to. And we trust that He is just in everything He does, because He is. Even when these things are, they don't make sense. If, if we have always believed that God is, that God is not a liar, and we know He's not, but if I send somebody to lie to somebody else, then I would be sinful. But God can do these things, again, because He is not a man. He is altogether righteous. And if He does these things to judge people, that is a, a righteous thing that He does. And though it's very confusing, I will admit. But it's right there. And I can give you another example. I give you a lot of examples. Um, God is sovereign in everything He does, and everything that happens. I mean, and righteous at the same time. But we are not. We are not Him. He is not us. We cannot judge what He does by the law that He holds us to. He is not subject to his moral law because that is for us and that is not for him. Um, his motives are different. His understanding is different. He is, he is beyond us. And that's, that's the thing that the Armenians cannot accept, that God is not us. And that he will not ever be like us. He will not ever be subject to the law that he expects us to uphold and and we cannot behave in any way the same because he is he is a righteous judge and he does these things that that we don't understand um i, I i'll find that other there's one really horrible passage and the Armenians, they, they like to say, you, you Calvinists, you Calvinists believe that God decrees children being molested and horrible things happening to children. And, and that means that your God is false. Well, there are horrible things that God does in the Bible. So if, if that's your standard for um, determining whether God is true, whether the Bible is true, whether my beliefs are biblical and true, that they are, that God only does 
um, understandable, comprehensible things or pleasant things, then that is, that's going to fail. That's not a, a true standard. And there's a passage in Jeremiah. So, and I wrote about this in the book that I wrote. In Deuteronomy, God tells the Israelites, he says, if you do not follow me and obey me, these are all the things that are going to happen to you. Famine, plague, your enemies will come and destroy you. All this stuff. And then, and then they, they go through all this idolatry and they, they forsake God and God's judgment comes upon them. And here we have Jeremiah prophesying and God is talking to the people through Jeremiah. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters and they will eat one another's flesh in the siege and then the distress, distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life will distress them. The enemies of Israel, they besieged the city and kept them cut them off from all supply, all food, and and there was nothing in the city. And this went on for months and months. And eventually, they just cannibalized each other. And there's a story in Kings. Yeah, story in Kings, where they were, they were besieged, and a woman, she goes to this other woman and said, okay, we're all starving. Give us your son. We will eat him today. And then tomorrow when we're hungry again, we will eat my son. And so the woman says, okay. Because they're all starving and dying. And so they cooked her son. And the next day the woman had hidden her son. And so this woman, whose son was dead, she went and told the king. And the king just, he breaks down. And this is during Elisha's time, and eventually the, the people turn to God, and um, the siege ends. But this was God's judgment, and he promised this would happen. And it said he made them do it. Now, here's another thing, another, another example where God's sovereignty makes no sense. He made them eat the flesh of their children that's what this that's what the text says but we know that men choose their own evil men make their own decisions and they are responsible for that god holds us responsible for the things that he decrees what do you want me to say <clears throat> and so this is this is a video that I made about um, Leighton and Heiser, and that a couple guys got really upset. <laughs> I didn't turn on the comments. Well, I mean, I know you guys are going to hate the video, so <laughs> what am I going to do? Just constantly respond to negative comments? I don't, I don't really care to do that. But the point is, this is God's doing, but it is completely um, the judgment God decreed it men willfully freely did it they were not forced to eat their children well in the sense that they were under siege but they were not forced to worship other gods but God decreed it what kind of sense does it make God does these things because he is God and, and it doesn't matter how much we protest that doesn't make any sense we're just we're just dust and worms and grass and we're not going to understand him so I, I just wanted to point these things out to all of you that we must read our Bibles carefully and not and not hold on to these notions that we've had for ages about who God is and and what he is allowed to do according to our beliefs because it's all there it's all there in the Bible and it's 
it's pretty intense. 